Hello everyone. Welcome to part two of our first lecture, Principles of Design. In this part of the lecture, we will explore a variety of visual elements that affect how art is created, used, and interpreted. As mentioned before, please feel free to pause this video at any time to take careful notes. We begin by looking at space. The term space here refers to the area that contains the artwork, the area manipulated and worked on by the artist that is then visible and offered for viewers to contemplate and experience. Here we see that artists can utilize space to give a sense of illusion or naturalism to an image, especially one that is made in two dimensions, consisting of height and width, but not depth. Alternatively, artists can also use space to ignore reality and collapse or compress the area occupied by the visual elements. Here are some of the components that artists use to design the space in an artwork. Size, overlapping, position, displaying or including different textures, adjusting the brightness of colors, and the use of perspective. Using size is an important way to express visually how elements within an image use the space. Typically, things that are bigger in size will take up more space or volume in the real world. And to mimic that phenomenon, artists will use the sizes of elements within the visual space to help viewers interpret the intended relationships and sizes of elements in the image. Here we have the print, The Great Wave Offshore at Kanagawa, created by Katsushika Hokusai in the 19th century. Hokusai has arranged the waves in this visual space to appear in an overlapping fashion, with the wave closest to us in the foreground appearing smaller than the wave farther away in the midground. The size of the large wave in the midground appears especially menacing and dangerous when compared to the size of the human figures in the canoes, who seem tiny in comparison and at the complete mercy of the ocean. Perspective, in addition to size, is an important way to communicate the appearances and relationships of components in an image. We are going to look at several types of perspective that artists use to create the illusion of a three-dimensional area within a two-dimensional visual space. Atmospheric perspective is the depiction of a space that allows the viewer to understand smaller elements to be farther away and larger elements to be closer, giving the illusion of a real three-dimensional experience when the actual visual space is only two-dimensional. For example, there are four temples on top of four hills in this image. Even though they are depicted on the flat surface, the temples appear to occupy different planes of physical space, with the largest temple on the left closest to us in the foreground, and the smallest temple in the center farthest away in the background. Notice that both size and color hues are utilized here to suggest an illusionistic portrayal of the landscape and the temples on the hills, with the darker or more saturated hues used to make the largest temple appear closer and the lighter, less saturated hues used to make the smallest temple appear far away. Linear perspective is a system devised by artists of the Italian Renaissance, who use mathematical relationships between lines and space to create the illusion of three-dimensional depth. Artists use linear perspective to arrange elements in a way that will create implied lines and focal points, called vanishing points, to enhance a viewer's ability to interpret a space as being three-dimensional. In this painting, Hylar allows the two-dimensional surface to look convincingly three-dimensional. Linear perspective is an important part of this effect. Let's take a closer look. Here you see the components of linear perspective that make Hylar's image so convincing. There is a horizon line bisecting the painting in half about 
midway up the height of the canvas. There is a focal point placed along the horizon line where the artist wants the viewer's attention to be drawn to. Take a close look and you'll notice that the focal point here is labeled as a vanishing point and it is right between those two figures in the foreground on the left. And then there are a number of implied lines that create converging lines, also known as orthogonals, to help direct our gaze to the focal point along the horizon line. By using these elements as guides, the artist can create a realistic looking space with the help of arrangement, color saturation, size, and now linear perspective. Linear perspective can contain one or more vanishing points, with orthogonals leading to them in the same technique as we just saw. Similarly, multi-point perspective allows artists to portray scenes from views other than directly frontal. Specifically, a worm's eye view portrays a scene from below, where the viewer is looking up, and a bird's eye view portrays a scene from above where the viewer is looking down. In this type of perspective, there are multiple vanishing points. In this woodcut print by Escher, we, the viewers, are situated above the scene portrayed in the image, putting us in a bird's eye view. The reason why this is also multi-point perspective is because there are multiple points in the images that could serve as focal points or vanishing points on various horizon lines. Look carefully and locate some of the implied lines that converge on a specific focal point. What do you notice? Do you see the columns, staircase, and rooftop terraces? Escher uses all of these components to direct your gaze to linger on different points of the image, moving up along the structure and taking in details as they come. The term foreshortening refers to the type of perspective that allows us to see something that is meant to be protruding toward us in a realistic way. Artists use foreshortening to increase the illusionism of the visual space by mimicking the way we would view items coming toward us in the real world. For example, Montaigne's The Lamentation Over the Dead Christ, also known as the foreshortened Christ, portrays the dead Christ figure from a surprising angle. The feet of the figure are meant to appear closer to us, the viewers, than his head, and Montaigne must adjust the angles, sizes, and focal points to create this illusion. In art, the term balance refers to having visual weight that exists in this image. Balance is often achieved by controlling the size and arrangements of elements within the image. When visual elements are equally distributed across the image, there is symmetrical balance. Artists often employ symmetrical balance to make their images more easily understood and visually appealing to viewers. Here we have a ritual container from the Shang Dynasty in what is now the country of China. This object displays symmetrical balance. If you bisected the object in half vertically down its center, you will find identical patterns and elements displayed. These types of containers were often used in ceremonies, often buried with the deceased to accompany them into the afterlife. As such, creating an object that demonstrates symmetry balance and harmony was an important part of its form and its function. In direct contrast to the symmetrical balance, asymmetrical balance is when artists distribute the visual weight of the image unequally, often placing more elements on one side of the image than the other, or perhaps adding more detail to one side than the other. For example, in this image, there are six persimmons portrayed, but they are not arranged in a symmetrical fashion. 
Instead, the asymmetrical balance of the image allows us to focus on the persimmons more individually, considering their subtle differences and unique qualities. Artists can also use scale to affect our interpretation of images. Scale is not the same as size, though they are closely related. Size refers to the dimensions of an element on its own, whereas scale refers to the relationship between the size of the viewer and the work of art. There are three types of scale that you will be expected to know and utilize. Monumental scale describes works that are or appear to be larger than they would normally exist or larger than the size of the viewer. Human scale describes works that appear to be the same size in the artwork as they are in real life, or are roughly the same size as the viewer. And miniature scale describes works that appear or are similar to how they would be in real life, or are smaller than the viewer. Consider how artists Oldenburg and Van Bruggen have played with scale in this work, Mistos, from 1992. This is a large sculpture in a public outdoor space. Although the sculpture is clearly larger, larger than the people around it, and is thus representing monumental scale, the subject matter is a packet of matches, which normally easily fit in the palm of one's hand. Artists use scale to surprise viewers, often inviting them to rethink their relationships to different objects in their lives by viewing them in ways they've never seen before. Another important type of scale is called hierarchical scale. This term describes the utilization of scale to denote importance by making the most important element the largest sized element in the image. In this carved relief scene from the Great Temple at Amun in Egypt, the figures are created in a variety of sizes. Rather than using size to communicate depth and illusionistic space, here the sizes of the figures show the importance of them in relationship to each other. Through hierarchical scale, the large figure on the right is likely the most significant figure in the scene, with the smaller figures in the center and the left of the image being less significant in comparison. Our last design element of the lecture is proportion. Although related to size and scale, proportion is the relationship between the sizes of the individual parts within an artwork or object, rather than its size in relation to other objects or the viewer. Here we see three drawings of an object, a vessel or container for liquids. Although they all depict symmetrical balance and share the same components, such as a base at the bottom, handles at the sides, and a lip at the top, they are all exhibiting different relationships between their height and width. These different relationships and proportions affect the dimensions and appearance of these objects, making them different from each other. In addition to the relationship between height and width, proportion can also relate to the parts of the human body. There are many examples throughout history of societies producing art and architecture based on measurements taken from the human body. And it is generally thought that using human proportions in art and architecture makes the viewing experience more pleasurable and relatable for viewers. In this graphic, we see how the human hand has been used as a measurement. By beginning with the smallest unit of the hand, fingers, we then advance to a collection of four fingers to create a palm, a collection of six palms to create a cubit, and finally four cubits 
to create the average height of a human. By creating art, objects, and structures based on elements of the human body, viewers can readily understand how the work relates to them, making it easier to comprehend and contemplate the visual elements and their meanings. This concludes part two of our first lecture on the principles of design. Feel free to return to this lecture video to review information and terminology on space, perspective, balance, scale, and proportion.